Well, we will begin. Second supersymmetry lecture. I put this up because we'll need it again, is uh, the, uh, the expansion of a superfield in general in terms of all of the different components. And we'll come back to this uh, when we uh, do our various manipulations. OK. So what I want to start with now is chiral superfields. Chiral superfields are obtained from a general superfield by applying one of these superspace derivatives to this object. So in particular, if I call I always get phi and psi confused in my mind. Phi, I believe. Uh, if we call this my general or my um, chiral superfield, it's defined by taking this super covariant. The superspace derivative acting on it uh, to vanish. Now, one can just go ahead and solve then for which pieces remain after applying this constraint. But it actually turns out, and you see this all over the place when you see superspace, that if you want to solve this constraint, so to solve, it's convenient to solve it in terms of a shifted definition of the variables that we start with. So instead of x theta and theta bar, we have y, which is defined as linear in x, and then, now I have to get my signs straight. I'm going to try something that might have slightly better precision. Let's try this. Uh, there. Okay, in terms of y, and then if I uh, if I take and rewrite this superspace derivative in terms of y, it looks like this. So d alpha is d by d theta alpha minus two i sigma. New and now let me get my alpha straight. So if you recall, in terms of x, when we had x here before, there was no two, and there was another term. Okay. Rewriting in terms of these y variables, the covariant, the superspace derivatives become this, which is convenient because it then says that when I act with this d dagger on phi to be zero, I'm only acting with with this uh, with this guy. And uh, so what that does is that means that when I plow this thing in to a general superfield here. Right, so I plow that in. If I plow that into a general superfield, this will kill off many of the different components here. So A is gone. Uh, since we're going with respect to theta dagger, that means this is gone. Uh, uh, yeah, where am I here? Many. Well, okay. So uh, yeah, this. Uh, I think I'm suddenly worried about my chi's, but anyway. I eliminate many of the terms, and if I thought long enough, if I was more awake, I'd figure out exactly which terms would go away. But you can see clearly that essentially w once, I take, once I take this super derivative and I act on, uh, on ver all of these terms, I will kill off various components. Uh, what am I left with? So let me, let me do this here. Yes.
sorry, what happened to this piece? So this is just taking this d by d x that used to be here, and then I just shifted variables there. And when you do that shift, you pick up one of these guys, it contracts through, and in, in, one, in one case it, it adds to this side, in the other case it just subtracts out. That's, how, that's just how it works. So it's just a shift of variables, assuming I've got all my signs right. Okay, so once we act with this D dagger on, on uh, this field and force this constraint, so we have then, let's, let me try this again. So you, take, you act with D dagger on this thing. This will kill off various terms. But then let's see what terms actually remain after I, after I do this. And uh, uh, yeah. This is, this is true, although I actually have the superfield written in general as well, just, uh, just to do it. But the problem is that I think I have to shift and then shift back again, but you're absolutely right. So if I do this, well, the easiest thing though is that then if I shift into these y variables and I solve for what phi is, let me just do it then. So then phi of y, phi, 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 phi of y in, in this expansion, it then becomes uh, a scalar field of y root 2 theta of y and now just because we have this issue of what it is in terms of y versus what it is in terms of x we can go back and shift the variables again and write this in terms of x okay so just shifting the variables by what I did up there and I get Okay. So from so from doing the shift, I then solve, I solve for it in in, in this form. Why is it in terms of pieces that only are in terms of theta simply because again when I act with the D dagger act with this guy on that means that I don't have any theta dagger in the expansion. So then I can go back and shift again and get the general superfield, the general chiral superfield out of this in terms of the x variables and it's this mess. From that then you can go and identify which components bam 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 survive and how they relate to the original components that we had over here. Uh, If we then do following operation, so if I then do a supersymmetric transformation, sorry, so on, on the superfield, so this was this thing of minus i epsilon. on this and I expand that out in components with respect to the y variables I get that this phi epsilon that so the fermion is Oh, 
Okay. So, all of this work to get to the point of the, the shifted variables, the, the, the scalar, the fermion, and the auxiliary field, doing a supersymmetric transformation on them gives me these results, which are exactly what we had sort of constructed before we got into any of the superspace business. So you can see then that this uh, allowing the, the writing everything in terms of superspace data, the coordinates, and in terms of superderivatives and so forth, allows us to then have these supersymmetric transformations be embedded in the technology. And that's sort of the whole point. That's why we do things are written in terms of superspace, so that all of this, 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 this supersymmetric transformation is manifest. Okay. Chiral superfields, uh, we'll talk a lot more about as we keep going. And as we'll see, the, um, all of the matter of the standard model, if extended into a supersymmetric model, will end up in chiral superfields. And so then they will have various components. And so whether I'm dealing with a fermion, like a quark, then I will have a superpartner of a squark, or vice versa, if I have a Higgs, then I have a superpartner of a Higgs genome, and so forth. And so we'll have to see how, how, how all of that shakes out on Monday. Uh, this was one simplification of the, of the, of the set of, all, of, you know, this general superfield, applying this, this uh, superspace derivative to it. You can construct the same thing. You can construct an anti-chiral superfield, again, analogously by taking a D alpha and acting on that. That's then done in terms of a shifted coordinate y, or y prime, or y star, as you like, which effectively flips what, what you're doing here. So you flip this sign, then you can flip this thing, you can go ahead and solve, and you can work out then what the superfield is in terms of, again, this shifted coordinate, appropriate to the anti-chiral superfield. So, yeah. Here. Do I have alpha dot in the, in the, you want it, you want it in the numerator? I don't. Sorry. Oh, you want this, you want this upper. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. All right, a beer for you too. <laughs> I, I'm gonna be careful about that. I, I, fear, I fear that I'm suddenly I'm incurring a great deal of debt over the next, uh, if every time I have an index flipped up or, run, or down, I have to pay out. All right. Uh, good. Um, okay. So chiral superfields, now we can go and construct a different constraint on this general superfield, one which will then allow us to embed uh, gauge fields, again, into a supersymmetric theory. You can kind of already guess what you'd have to do for a gauge theory. You have an object here that smells awfully like right, a gauge boson, this V mu, but it was complex gauge fields are in the adjoint representation. They're not complex. So the logical thing would be then to have as a vector superfield to require that it is real. And when I do, when I enforce this condition, then I automatically have then that the uh, so I have in components v mu is v mu star. So this is already smelling good. And then I can keep on going with the rest of the different components. So obviously if v is real, then a is real, and there are various other constraints on all of the component fields. Some of them, uh, did I write it down or not? Ah, yeah. So, well, 
You want to see them all? Let's, okay, I'll just show you. So we have that, we have, and I'm, I slightly fear whether I've got my Kai right, but I think so. This dagger. Now I'm really fearing for uh, my, uh, my beer consumption. My, I should say my wallet, but anyway, as I say. And this. Okay, so these are the constraints. Now, there's a, there's a, um, once we do this, then it's sort of logical that we would identify this with a gauge field. Okay. There's one other small shift that is traditional, which is that the D component is written as one half D, one quarter, D mu, D mu, A. If you like, this is just a sort of shift of the variables so that the, uh, the, the, this, this, this piece ends up pulling out the total derivative, or this, the total derivative of A. So uh, this is one shift, and the eta is written as this minus I over 2. This chalk is, oh, well, not right here. These shifts make it easier to identify what D will ultimately become. Bear with me on that one and you'll see. And this shift also makes it easier to identify what the fermionic component, the fermionic superpartner to the gauge field will be, which is this lambda, which will be the gauge eno. So this one you see. This one you probably see. Uh, let's take C equal to B star. Uh, C, B, star. So S equal to S dagger. If I dagger, if I dagger S, I dagger, dagger, and I, take, and I get a B star. And I keep going. Just, just that simple. Uh, We could again carry out a supersymmetric transformation on this field and then see how it goes through. This is a big mess, so let's not do it. Uh, let's instead consider some aspects of what V would mean to be a gauge field. Okay. So we have then that V we're going to identify with this gauge field A. And for the time being, I'm imagining this is a U1 abelian theory. So there's no additional indexes on this. We'll come back to how that alt alters things in a bit. But for now, it's just abelian. So it's just, it, just like QED. And so then and here's this gay geno, and then this funny D piece, and then the other, the other funny components. So this looks, this looks pr unlike the chiral superfield, though, where here it was sort of clear that, well, we knew this was a, an auxiliary field, so we know that we'll eventually go and integrate it out and rewrite it in terms of whatever interactions result from that. So that taking a Higgs and extending it to having a Higgsino, or taking a fermion like a squark, excuse me, <laughs> a quark, and extending it to having a uh, squark, you can kind of un uh, you know, understand the identification of the fields that would happen in a supersymmetric generalization of the standard model. This is confusing because we seem to have now a bunch of additional fields even after the constraint was imposed, right? So we have, some, we have objects which you could sort of naively expect, okay, a gauge field and a gauge eno, and then some auxiliary thing, fine. But then we still have these components C and A and C or chi or whatever I want to do, right? Uh, So these additional pieces correspond to an additional redundancy uh, of a supersymmetric
Now, what do I mean by redundancy? I mean this in the same sense as when we take a mu and we do a gauge transformation on it, minus plus, I never remember which way this goes, but up to a definition of what my gauge parameter is. Right, I don't know, plus or minus, it doesn't matter. Let's call it plus. Uh, this is the redundancy exactly corresponding to, a ga to what happens with the gauge interaction, as you all know. So now, we need to understand, well, if we have V, how do we, how do we incorporate this, this gauge invariance of V? Or, for that matter, is V itself gauge invariant? Okay, so we need to sort of think that one through. So the question is then, if we do some transformation on this real superfield, this vector superfield V, what could we possibly transform that would correspond to what this thing would go through as? Okay. Who has guesses? Who doesn't know the answer, by the way? If you know the answer, be quiet. All right. Who has guesses as to what it should do? No guesses. So what? It's unchanged. V goes to V. I don't owe you a beer. No. So that, this, this doesn't work. And actually, by the way, you can kind of see how this doesn't work because, again, the, 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 if I extract out the, the A mu component, right? I extract out the A mu component, that's V mu here. V mu just went to V mu once I did that. So I didn't get this derivative of this additional gauge parameter. So somehow I have to embed this into a, into a superfield, right? So then how do we embed this into a superfield? Well, you can just start guessing things, right? When in doubt, don't, you know, be so... Okay, does that work? Clearly not, because Lorentz indices don't match. Okay. Uh, what else could we do with this? Well, we had super space derivatives, so maybe the alpha, something. I don't know. I don't know what I put here. I could put a V, or maybe I put a... It doesn't make sense to put a V, because this thing doesn't really act in a way in which this makes sense. I could do that. Okay, but then there's also no indices hanging off the end of this thing. So that's already a little odd. Uh, worse still is that d alpha with respect to this chiral superfield uh, is not necessarily real. Okay. So this also wouldn't satisfy the reality condition of what, ha what happens with v. So that can't work. So we could try to embed this into a chiral superfield. We could say, well, maybe this goes over into phi, but again, this thing is not real. By definition, we impose this super, super space derivative on it to determine this. We didn't put a reality condition on. Well, that doesn't work. You could try that. And now we're getting close. Oh, by the way, there's one more thing you could try. You could try this, or maybe the, the starred version of it. Okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, but again, if I embed whatever this gauge parameter is into the chiral superfield separately, then this wouldn't be linear in that guy. Right? So that doesn't work. So the only thing I can do in a linear way is something like this. Now, uh, if I work out what the components of this thing are, uh, for a for a uh, for a chiral superfield, um, what I need to do is go back to my result in terms of x, because again v is in terms of x, so I need to work in an, an x in a x coordinate for this, or otherwise I don't know what I'm doing. And if I do that, and then I want to identify how v mu or a mu shifts. Let's extract out the component, which is the theta dagger sigma bar mu theta. So out of here, 
that corresponds to i d mu phi uh, plus the, the complex conjugate, so minus d mu phi star. Now this is looking promising because we wanted something that goes as right the derivative of some real function, this gamma. This is looking promising, although it's got this i and it's got a sign. And so you can either deal with that and decide that you're going to take the imaginary component of this field and call that your gauge parameter. Or, as is conventional, I'll put, I'll put it up again in a second. You write this as, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I've got to get my stupid sign straight or, or I'm going to owe a beer again. Uh, hang on, hang on. Signs are my, are my nemesis. Uh, I think I want, I think I want, yeah, I think I want plus i star minus, where again, obviously what we've done here is extracted out the real part of this whole thing, but just flipped this around. When I do that, then an i star minus means that I end up with that, board magic. All right. I think I got it straight. Let me check. I think, I think, I think, yeah. OK. So let's just do, let's just simplify this one more way. That. So now, what this means is that this, uh, this chiral superfield, phi, 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 its, its uh, real component of the, of the scalar, the lowest component of that field, but the real part of that then be behaves as this gauge parameter. And then that corresponds to a gauge transformation with respect to a mu. So, great. We now have, we now have uh, the gauge symmetry implemented. Yes? Scalar on the superspace, yes. I mean, in the sense that its lowest component is a scalar, correct. That's right. Okay. <laughs> uh, what's meant by it is I'm only looking at this particular component of this this function of superfields. That's, uh, it's just, uh, I'm not saying this is some elaborate notation, I, for lack of a better way of doing it. You'll see what exactly what I mean in just a moment. Just bear with me. Yep. Yep. Yes. Good question. You should try and see if it works. And then report back on Monday. Yeah, we're coming to that. We're coming to that. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. Okay. Now, I said this component had this particular transformation. We can then go ahead and do the transformations of the other fields, and it turns out that, so if you like, um, the component, I mean, how do I say this? If I do, so a mu, or I guess a sub mu, goes to a mu minus plus, which way does it go? I think it's plus d mu phi plus phi star. So that is v goes to v plus i. One of these days, I'll get the Greek alphabet straight. Um, phi, psi, phi, whatever it is. That, that object uh, starred minus the other guy. And that gives me this for this particular component. I can go ahead and do the other components. So lambda, alpha, lambda, alpha. All right, how do I get that? Oh, you got to turn the crank and so forth. D goes to D. This is partly why the, the little d and the eta were defined the way they were, so that then this goes through. I'll, let, I'll leave this, you can verify this very quickly, sort of as an exercise. However, we still have a, a or a star, this, the real component of that, way, way up there. And we have this additional fermion and then this C or B star. So we have these additional degrees of freedom still left over. And we have to see what happens to them. So here's what happens to them. A goes to A plus I star minus C alpha, C alpha root two psi alpha. And B is to B minus I F. Sorry about the chalk. Maybe I can help with this. Okay, so these are the last components I need to deal with. So what's interesting is that this gauge transformation that we've done, where this is then represented as the gauge parameter, left these invariant, as it was defined up there, and then each of these components shifted into either some, well, the imaginary part of this guy, right? That's what I'm extracting out of here. And then uh, these shift, again, in this way, not pulling out any additional components of the field, or of either the fields we expect are there or the, or the, uh, the D term. So these sets of transformations suggest then that you can do a choice where I, will, I choose a particular F. Uh, now this is the, sorry, and let me be clear about what I, what I just did. I should probably didn't tell you what all of these components were. So this was the lowest component. And then... And yeah, someone's going someone's gonna to debate my, oh, but I put a tilde on that. Fantastic. OK. And uh, see, the tildes, they're going to come back. And then we had this. OK. So this fermion, that f, this fermion, that f. So what it means is that the gauge transformation that I did uses this component for the gauge field. And then these additional pieces, f, and the fermion allow me to, if you like, reabsorb whatever the shifts would have been in these, in these other components. Or put differently, there is a particular super gauge, which is called the Wessomino gauge, where you take, you choose these components such that whatever these things are, vanish. So that the lowest components of V, all of these lowest components of V go away. So all of this, all of this, all of this crap here. Okay. So there is a, if you like, this Wessumino gauge then allows us to write V in Wessumino gauge as the lowest component 
Now, if someone debates my daggers and bars before I check, I'm not going to pay out. So I have that, and then I have a theta dagger, the, oh my, it's a, it's a lambda, and then I've got a And I, let's see if I'm missing anything. Yeah, I'm always missing something. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is it. So we do a gauge transformation. Bam, bam. This thing goes over to this mess, okay, and that's exactly what you would have normally expected for a gauge transformation of a gauge field. Uh, upon doing this, you could say, well, wait, but I just did that. That means that then A may shift. Well, but then I can just reabsorb that by a redefinition of what I meant by this guy. So I redefine the components of this, of this chiral superfield gauge parameter, or chiral superfield, I don't know how you say that. I don't know. It's, these words just get so long, it's, it's hard to, anyway. Uh -huh. So uh, you just reabsorb it away, and then, and then you're done. So that's it. So that's our, that is then our proposal for what we'll use for a um, gauge field. Precisely, yes. These are all, so all of these guys are gauge redundancies. And that's manifest because under a gauge transformation, they shift. Yeah, the, so they are in the sense that they're, well, they are with respect to that mess, the, the phi star minus phi. Yes. There is precisely such a thing, though I'm not sure you should think about it directly in terms of these components. And that, uh, Let's come back to the issue of spontaneously breaking when we get to Higgsing the, the, st the supersymmetric standard model. Monday, hopefully, Monday. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It, it, if you do those choices, then you get this. Inspired. Right. OK. Other issues? Yeah. If you, I guess, in the interest without the redundancy, if you try to write down a. So if you try to write down a theory of electricity. So let me ask my question. Would it be possible to construct a vector theory with a vector superfield such that you don't have this gauge redundancy and that all of these extra gauge redundancy? That would be tantamount to saying, can I, can, can I write down a theory that is not supersymmetric with a spin one particle that does not have a gauge invariance associated with it? So there is one puzzle with this, which is that if I do a supersymmetric transformation, of the Wessomino uh, vector superfield. And I work this out in terms of the components. What does a supersymmetric transformation mean? It means this guy starts moving into this guy, this guy moves into that guy, and you know, and so forth, right? 
all of the different components mix up in some well-defined way, which I conveniently didn't write down because, you know, it's, it's tiring up here. Um, okay, you can, you, can, you can see it. So components mix is all you really need to know. But in particular, you get some of these components show up after I do, um, uh, after I do a supersymmetric transformation of these components. So the issue then is that under supersymmetry, this super gauge is sort of not manifest. So this is a curious sort of state, but here's the deal. So essentially, if I had not absorbed all of these components, well, then I could have just done a supersymmetric transformation and life would have been fine and things mix up. But then if I did the supersymmetric transformation and then things mixed up, I could then just go and do another gauge transformation and then remove all of the components. Right. So essentially what that means is I can't do a supersymmetric transformation of a gauge field in West Domino gauge without also doing a gauge transformation. I have to do both. Which is also another way of saying, by the way, that whenever you start to write down your own favorite action with your own favorite sets of terms, you have to be very careful that whatever you start writing down, you obey these two fundamental principles, right? That under a supersymmetric transformation, I have to still do a gauge transformation or vice versa. Okay, so that's, that's all I want to say about a vector superfield uh, in the theory. Questions, yeah. Don't commute, don't commute. There, yeah, I mean, but it may, it may mean that I just end up having to redefine what I call these components in the first place. But since I had that redundancy, Yeah, I mean, in, in, in this sense, right? In the sense that these components mix, right? But then I can, I can always do this gauge transformation and then pfft, reabsorb. Exactly. That's why we can write things in terms of West Amino. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Sorry, uh, you, you, if you fix a gauge, you're, you're fixing something about you know, this component, right? So in other words, once you fix a gauge, the redundancy is no longer there. Because of this. Under that, this happens. And when this happens, these pe I get, I regenerate components, right? So I'll regenerate some of these bits. The components that are not written here, right? The theta and the scalar components. That's it. All right. So V. So that's, this is, V is, in some sense, somewhat analogous to A. A meaning the gauge field, okay? In the sense that it is uh, not manifestly gauge invariant because, well, when I do a gauge transformation, this is, you know, I get this, things mix up and A mu shifts over and so forth, okay? So at some point, we'll have to construct something that would be manifestly gauge invariant and supersymmetric, and we'll get there very soon. But what I want to turn to now is, now that we have this technology in terms of superfields, chiral superfields, antichiral superfields, vector superfields, we now want to construct an actions out of them, Lagrangians, okay, in terms of the, the fields. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to erase everything. Okay.
Now, yes. Correct. It was not dynamical. It had fixed components. Yeah. Yeah. It's in the same sense as it is the supersymmetric analog of the gauge parameter. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. So, Lagrangians. So how do we construct supersymmetric Lagrangians is to write down components of chiral, uh, chiral or uh, vector superfields that themselves are supersymmetric. Meaning that if I do a supersymmetric transformation, right, I get back the thing that I start with. Now, let me see if I can refresh your and my memory one moment oh you know what I don't think did I do it here I think I did it or maybe I didn't do it ah, it doesn't matter okay um, so Okay, so the first proposal is that if I had a general superfield S, this guy, and I do a supersymmetric transformation on it, uh, the one component that remains invariant with respect to that supersymmetric transformation is D. And some of you may be asking, how do I see that? And I, I, I may, I this, uh, <coughs> I may have skipped this last time, and that's the problem that I'm now facing. Uh, one moment. Yeah, I don't, I think I, well, anyway, yeah, that's okay. All right. Uh, so I construct then an action. So now my, this is S action as opposed to S chiral superfield out of, B4X Lagrangian, of course, where L now has to uh, be in terms of these superfields. But if I want to construct something that is itself uh, supersymmetric, if these components transform into e each other, well, then obviously the individual components are not going to be suitable for being able to write down an action. So the proposal is essentially then that I write this as um, so one term I could write would be d4 theta s, which would then effectively pull out just this lowest component. Now, in fact, under a supersymmetric transformation, d doesn't go exactly to d. It goes to d plus derivatives of the scalar. But this is where the joy of Lagrangians is all about, in that just because I do a shift, if I get back d, get back linear thing, and then I get back a total derivative of x, the action with respect to something that is a total derivative here is invariant. Right? So up to total derivatives, then, this term, which corresponds to another way of saying that is the s superfield, the theta, theta, theta bar, theta bar component, which is also d, is uh, is one possibility. Ah, I did it here. I did do this transformation. Sorry. So let me now do this. Sorry. This is what I get for looking. Okay. So if I now do this, if I do a supersymmetric transformation of this action, then I end up with, and I'm clearly misremembering this, but that's fine. Here we go. Let me just do it. I got half of it right. All 
All right, so I got half of it right and half of it wrong. Sorry. The half I got right is that it's a total derivative with respect to these components. The half I got wrong is that it's fermionic, okay, which is probably not surprising since I started with the scalar. So this is then total derivatives with respect to these fields. So then under the action, I can ignore this. Okay, so that means then this is one way, one term that I can construct that is supersymmetric in the theory. Now, if I take the uh, D component to let me do this. So one possibility would be, well, you know, I did this for a general superfield. We just constructed a vector superfield. We could do it for that and say D4 theta, the vector Wesumino for an abelian theory. This will pull out, so this is equivalent to component. And that component that we had was, and this is where I had the derivative with, res with respect to the scalar in my mind, that was 1 half d plus d mu, d mu a or phi or something. I don't remember. It, it doesn't matter because it's a total derivative. So. so we just end up with that. Uh, I might have. Conventionally, there's a sign here, but don't don't worry about that. That does. If I happen to take this term and then I put a coefficient in front, say, let's call it kappa, then I would end up with 1 half kappa d. If I happen to put a 2 in front, this goes away. And this thing is known as the, I'm not going to spell their names right, so I'll just, the fi term, the Faye Iliopoulos term in the supersymmetric theory. Because, you know what, we'll need V. So let's just write out what V is. So V in terms of x mu theta is Okay. All right. So, uh, since V in, excuse me, West Amino gauge is this set of fields, you see that A, right, for, for an abelian theory, carries no indices. So this, since this doesn't carry any indices, these don't carry any indices. Had we had a non-abelian theory, like QCD, oh, this. had we had a non-abelian theory, there would be some index there, A, for the, for the different um, components. And then there'd be an A there, there'd be an A there, there'd be an A there. Which means then that you see this term can only or could not be written for a non-abelian term. So, there's all, so this whole thing only works, this particular thing only works only for U1. There's another set of terms that we can try to extract out. There. From the chiral superfields. And 
there again, if you recall that when we introduced the auxiliary field F, we had that its supersymmetric transformation was just the, uh, the total derivative, or the, the equation of motion for the fermion. So it looked like minus i, epsilon dagger, I'm getting all my bars straight, d mu uh, phi, the psi, the fermion. Okay, so under a supersymmetric transformation, f, in terms of the y cohort, in terms of the, um, the, which ones do I want? I think I want y. In terms of the, uh, those coordinates then is just, again, a total derivative with respect to uh, this fermion, which suggests then an action that you can write. So a supersymmetric action, so this implies supersymmetric action that would look like d squared theta uh, I don't want f. What I want is, excuse me, I want the, the chiral superfield that contained this f. Now on this side, this action here, when we had it in terms of the Wessomino real superfield, this was manifestly real, right? Because that's how we constructed it. Which also tells me then that the Lagrangian is Hermitian, the action's real, you know, the usual properties that we all know and love for being able to do a quantum field theory. Here, this thing, right, is not real. And in fact, so it's complex in general. So we have to add the Hermitian conjugate or charge conjugate, depending on which, which, which particular, which instance you like to do. Oh, sorry. Let me do it this way. Let me actually just write it out. Sorry. So we have to add d squared theta dagger, okay, which is then usually just written as Hermitian conjugate or charge conjugate. So then this piece, okay. So then this piece, for example, this lowest component is. Um, sorry, and of course I'm missing the usual thing you would put into an action. Okay, so there, there. So this piece, the lowest component of this, is then just uh, f of this chiral superfield. And again, I do the supersymmetric transformation up to a total derivative. Total derivative goes through here and. So then I can construct out of that uh, terms that are supersymmetric uh, and w get whatever component interactions or component terms that follow from that. Good. Thus far, this is still not particularly useful because you see that all we've got so far is some funny term that we can write down for an abelian theory and something in terms of a single chiral superfield here. Where we begin to actually get much more non-trivially interesting things is then when we have products of superfields. Okay, so what kind of products can we have? So we can take, um, say, v to the nth power if we want. And this, of course, is, if this started being real, it will remain real. So this is an example of something that would still be a, uh, a vector superfield. Uh, or, excuse me, uh, this would be a real superfield. The vector, of course, is only the single component. Chiral superfields are more interesting because there you can do um, phi star phi. And then this thing, of course, is manifestly real. You can then do combinations of the chiral superfields themselves, like phi to the nth power. But if I do Again, n powers of chiral superfields expanded in terms of 
I didn't write it. The lowest component, you know, the, this guy and that guy, right, a Cairo superfield is just bing, bing, that without this thing, and then without all this crap, okay, so it's just bam, bam, bam. If I multiply out several chiral superfields, then uh, again, uh, I, this, will, this will give me back another chiral superfield. There's no way of getting an anti-chiral piece out of this. So this gives me chiral. And of course, the last one. Outstanding. Yes, we're getting there. Yep, you're correct. Yep. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I'll say that. Or better yet, rather than saying it, when the time comes, I'll point to you. All right. Yes. Correct. I, more specifically, what I meant was just this piece here in the Lagrangian, because this is the Lagrangian now, right, contains then this guy. Uh, up to some dumb sign, which I'm not going to get straight right now. So don't, don't, don't force the overall sign on me. No beers for that. Sorry, what? Correct. So, sorry. So, you, yes. so, so out of here, I would have an F. Out of there, I would have an F star. But I was only referring to this. That's what the pshht meant. Yeah. Only still only one beer for you. Okay. Uh, so when we do these expansions of the chiral superfields, when we do expansions of products of chiral superfields, then we get uh, a series of um, terms that will end up looking awfully familiar from our ordinary quantum field theory uh, days. So that's what I want to do next. So if we, the, one of them that is uh, uh, immensely useful is this product. So this is a real superfield. And if we expand it out, well, we have, well, first of all, how do we expand this thing out? So if we expand this thing out in terms of y, we would have to expand this in terms of y bar. And then we end up with something complicated. So it's easier in this instance, for example, to expand out these things in terms of x. Because then I've got x here and I've got x there, and I don't have to figure out having to reshift it again. But you'll get the same thing either way. So if I, if I do this, which I've done in the notes, and I had exercise, settle the dust, which means after the dust settles, this is what you get. So the exercise is to settle the dust. Let me just sort of give you some hint as to how this goes, right? So if I, if I expand this thing out, you end up with, OK, so we have a phi star. We have a minus i. Let's just see how this goes. Sigma bar mu theta d mu star. There is a theta, theta, theta bar, theta bar d mu, d mu phi star root two so I just expanded out what phi, phi star is in terms of the component fields in the x basis. I could do the same thing here also in the x basis. And I get exactly the same set of terms. This is, for now, I'm just assuming this is the same chiral superfield, but just you know, conjugated. I'll get the same set of things, but then without the stars and daggers. So you can see how that's going to go. This thing is a real superfield. Right? So that the thing that I can put into an action 
is a d4 theta of this guy. Right? Because its lowest component, again, will shift under a supersymmetric transformation with some total derivative. We don't care about total derivatives. So what's this? This is going to be, this is also defined as the theta, theta, theta dagger, theta dagger component. So what I need to do is multiply all of these terms and extract out the theta, theta, theta bar, theta bar, sorry, theta dagger components. And you can see some of the terms that come out. So I clearly end up with, so I had a field phi here multiplying across with this guy. So I end up with a this d mu d mu phi star. There's one term. Another, ter another term would be where I take, um, so in this expansion, I've got a theta dagger psi bar, psi dagger. This multiplied by the analog of this term in this lower piece, which would be the theta, theta, theta dagger, sigma something or other, is this without the dagger. I might have gone too quickly for you, but you get the idea. You, you multiply all the terms across. You extract the theta component. So obviously, there's going to be another component which will have fermions in it. And, the fer and, and those will comprise something where I had a single fermion multiplying a term that has sigma mu derivative of the fermion, one of them with a dagger, one of them without. And if I get my eyes straight and so forth, it looks like I psi bar d bar u psi. And then last but not least, the f component here, theta dagger, theta dagger, multiplying theta, theta f, gives me a f star f. And so then the net result of this particular term that we could have written into the action is a kinetic term for the scalar, a kinetic term for the fermion, and then this f star f for the auxiliary field. squared theta. We can, and we'll do that next. So eager. This is great. All right. So we got that one down. Uh, yes. So we can certainly do the top thing, which was exactly what you want to do. Notice, though, that the the top action as written with a single chiral superfield, which when then you know, expanded into its components, just this F piece. Uh, obviously, if, if, if this um, phi, psi, phi, whatever it is, chiral superfield transforms under a gauge theory, it has some gauge parameters you know, kicking around on it, whether it's in a fundamental representation or whatever it is, which means then that this term, those terms would be forbidden as written. Right? So we would have to write, you know, just because it's supersymmetric doesn't mean we don't, get, we don't have to impose usual, you know, gauge invariance of all of the terms. And that follows through for all of the chiral superfields as well. So we will have to write then terms, anything that I can write up there in this action has to be gauge invariant combinations of the chiral superfields. All right, we'll get there. So that I can certainly do. Uh, but I actually want to do, I want to do... I want to do, I did that, I did that. Okay, no problem. Uh, yeah. So then I, but now I want to do this, uh, the, um, the, uh, um, uh, the gauge fields themselves. And it's easiest to do this for an abelian theory. So a U1. Once you do this, then the non-abelian sort of follows. And it's not, it, it's, it's straightforward. So in the abelian case, uh, as we sort of spoke of before, 
we have this West Amino real superfield, vector superfield, but it shifts under a gauge transformation. So what we would like is something where we can finally extract out an f mu nu f mu nu, right, out of the theory. So that we have a manifestly gauge invariant kinetic term. So to do that, what would be ideal is to begin with a manifestly gauge invariant uh, supersymmetric chiral superfield or superfield. And there, this is where then our old friend, the superspace derivative, comes back to help us. So we can define a quantity, sometimes with a script, sometimes I, my script will never look different than if, if it didn't have a script, so I'm not going to give up immediately. I can define an object, let me call it W alpha, which is d dagger, d dagger, d alpha, v. So this object is the d daggers are the superspace antiderivatives suitably contracted. This is the superspace derivative with an index here. This is our West Amino guy. And I'm just, I have constructed out of this uh, um, an object which then has a, has a hanging index on it. Now, what kind of object have I constructed from this? Well, once I start hitting it with the superspace derivatives, this thing's no longer real, right? And uh, since I'm hitting this with two d bars, right, in each of these cases, that will pull down all of the theta daggers out of here. With all the theta daggers gone, and I'm left with then just thetas left over, then I have a chiral superfield. So this is a It's actually given some funny name. Uh, it is the uh, the field strength chiral superfield for reasons you'll see in just a moment. So, as with all chiral superfields, I can take products of them and then extract out an action. So, up there, I had a single chiral superfield. Here, I could take two of them. And oh, and by the way, wherever we had the question about can I have hanging indices off S, now I have a hanging index, right, off this guy. Okay, so I can construct then out of this uh, the terms at the top, which are d squared theta. I have a W. There's a chiral superfield. I'm going to have to take the charge conjugate of whatever I end up with writing in here. Yeah, so let me just write that right away to handle the charge conjugate people in the audience. And, and then, so I've got a W alpha, but now clearly this, right, is not Lorentz invariant with this, this hanging index off the end. So one thing I can do is contract it in. And now if I want to follow my usual notation about index contraction, I have a feeling that what I want to do is put an alpha there and an alpha there. Okay. Now, if I take this and expand that out into components, it doesn't move. If I take that and expand out into components, I get well, I'm going to do one, one small thing. Let's normalize with a one quarter and expand out into components. It becomes, ah, it becomes, it becomes, uh, This is not obvious from what I've written so far, because really, to see that there was an f mu nu here anywhere, 
I needed to plow this stuff into V and see what the components are. In the last negative two, five, whatever minutes I have, let me just show you how that works. And then that will allow me to wrap up today. Actually, they told me I had to end on time today, but then they shifted the schedule. Which means, you know what that means. We can just keep going through lunch and keep doing supersymmetry and uh, have our super lunch. Okay. Uh, or lunchino, depending on your point of view. Um, so to see this, I need to write out what W alpha is in terms of components. And to do that, I need to plow through these derivatives on V. So here's our V. And now I start plowing derivatives through. Uh, um, I think they're telling me something about uh, end this lecture now or else. All right. All right. Let me just write out what this looks like. So you, you settle the dust. You plow the derivatives through, the, the super derivatives onto V. And when you do that, you extract out what W alpha is. It's just the straightforward algebraic manipulations. And when you do that, you get then the lowest component here. Well, you can kind of guess what the lowest component is going to be because d bar d bar d, right? d bar. One, two, three, gone, lambda. So the lowest component is obviously going to be lambda. That's straightforward to see. You can see again here, if I plow this thing through, I'll end up with a, uh, let me just make sure I got my, yeah. I end up with a theta d here from the last term. Uh, d, OK? Uh, with, it happens to be no twos, so I'm happy. There's my index. Okay, so those terms are great. Um, the other terms are the ones that require work, and they look like sigma mu, sigma bar mu, theta, alpha, f mu nu, theta, theta. For this, to extract that out, you have to write, expand each of these guys out. They have their own sigma mu or sigma mu bars with derivatives. You plow all of that through into here. Those derivatives, as they plow through, will hit the a mu component. And then you'll get, com you get the combination, which ends up being f mu nu. And of course, when you do this, you also get uh, a derivative with respect to the fermion. And so then when I take W alpha, W alpha, smush that together, uh, you see that I extract the theta, theta squared component. That gives me the D squared. Theta, theta squared gives me F mu nu, F mu nu. And then uh, theta, theta here, multiplying no, nothing on the other side there, right, will give me then the kinetic term for the gauge genome. So that concludes constructing supersymmetric Lagrangians in terms of chiral superfields and vector superfields. And then what we will do is we'll briefly go through how this looks like in QED, extracting out the relevant interactions, the non-trivial pieces of this on Monday, and then we will turn to the supersymmetric standard model. Okay. Thank you.